Hello everyone, um, my name is Marcus Thiel. Um, I'm European politics professor at FIU and I'm very um, glad to welcome you all, uh, the ones who made it despite traffic out here and found um, a parking spot and everything, um, to welcome you here at FIU for our series of roundtables and this one today is on a very interesting topic. Um, in a, it's about developing a competitive workforce in a globalized economy with particular focus on sort of commonalities and differences between the US and Germany. And as you can imagine, um, in such an increasingly globalized um, economy, you need specific sp skills. These can be language skills, these can be sort of organizational skills, these can be intercultural skills. So we want to learn a little bit more about these today with a wonderful panel. But before I um, quickly uh, ask the panelists to present some of their, their expertise, um, I just want to also note that this is a series of roundtable that has been funded by the so-called Deutschlandjahr grant that um, I'm um, organizing with under the leadership of Professor Louise Davidson Schmich. So thank you, Louise, um, for organizing it so well, as well as um, with funding provided by the German consulate and the German embassy. So thanks also to them. Um, it's also co-funded by the Goethe Institute and supported by the Federation of German Industries. So if, for, within the Deutschland Jahr, um, events are being held in all 50 US states over the course of this year. We had already three previous roundtables. Uh, one on climate change, one on gender and sexuality, and one on migration policies. And these have been video recorded, just as this one will be. So if you have a problem being video recorded, I hope you don't, then uh, please let us know or let us our vide video videographer know. Um, these um, links to the videos you can find on your uh, flyers on the chair in case you want to see the recorded videos. So then, without further ado, let me just start by um, going one by one. Um, each of you will have about eight to ten minutes. I uh, will give you the, the red consular card <laughs> when we get to the one minute order as a reminder. And so our, my first speaker, or our first speaker, is going to be Dr. Isabella Isabel Kirschner. She will speak about the future of work. Dr. Isabel Kirschner comes to us comes to us from Munich, where she is a renowned expert on a variety of topics regarding the future of work. After her professional career in political consulting, she started her own business, working with hundreds of professionals, leaders, and organizations on topics like diversity management, employer branding, and work-life balance issues. She is the author of the new book, The New Work. Thank you very much for coming, Dr. Kirschner. The floor is all yours. Yeah, um, I'm going to speak on the future of work and in Germany the term new work is what we call it, what we talk about um, most of the time. And I was on a panel just recently where um, somebody was sitting next to me and he said, I really can't hear that sh new work any longer. It's just a buzzword, it's just in German we call it a sau die durch Dorf getrieben wird, a pig running through the village or whatever you want to call it. So people are already getting a little sick of new work and they're also scared. And this is something that you can see here as well. And when I just um, um, Googled um, or put in Google News the future of work and um, what people think of it and you can see a lot of headlines are robots competing for your job. So people are scared of losing their jobs. Um, Arbeit 4.0, Deutsche haben Angst vor der digitalen Revolution, the Germans are afraid of the digital revolution. Um, how to prevent the robot, uh, robot apocalypse. And um, droht mit der Digitalisierung jedem zweiten Job das aus. So will every second job be taken away by digitalization. And these are headlines from both countries. So um, back three years ago when I wrote my book and when I did research on the topic, I thought it's a typical German angst that people in Germany would say, ah, oh, it's all about the future and we want to keep it as it is. It's kind of, we like it the way it is. We don't want to change a lot of things. But then I started um, looking at other countries and looking at North America and the US and I spoke to researchers here and they said it's just the same. People are afraid, people are afraid of losing their jobs, they're afraid of losing their jobs to machines of course and yes no matter where you go and where you look the restaurant of the future you have um, a digital kiosk to order your food, um, you have um, self-checkout 
Um, you have robots who do um, carry things through um, the distribution warehouses. And um, this is a picture actually taken at the um, Saturn, which is kind of a best buy in Germany, in Ingolstadt, in, in Bavaria, the state where I come from. And this robot will take the customer to the place where he or she can find her or his product. And every one of you who goes to um, whatever, goes shopping uh, eventually and doesn't order everything online, when you go shopping and you ask somebody in the, in the shop, um, it often happens that people don't really know, can really give you a lot of information. They don't know where things uh, are. So this robot will solve all these problems because he know or she, whoever, whatever it knows exactly um, where to go and what to do. And also, and I have a quote here that I have to read um, with the machines. There is the advantage that Digital devices are always polite, always upsell. They never take a vacation, never show up sick, never, um, there is never a slip and fall or an age, sex or race discrimination case, says um, the former CEO of Hardy's restaurants. So um, there are quite a few advantages and um, um, yeah, where machines actually really are the better worker compared to the human being. And um, I got a few numbers for you and I thought I saved the examples for the panel discussion and just give you a, a little theoretical background here um, and a few numbers. Retail clerks and cashiers constitute 6% of the US workforce or 8 million workers and um, 3.1 million um, work in retail in Germany. So you can see that there is a big number of people who really do have reason to be afraid that their jobs will be taken over by robots or machines. Um, the use of robots is expanding around the world. Uh, the number sold doubled from 2016 um, to over 10 million, um, with 5.6 million to over 10 million in two, um, 2017. So that's only within one year, the number of robots that are used doubled. Um, Japan has the most, uh, followed by North America and uh, Germany. Another example is truck drivers, so it's not only in retail, it's not only salespeople. Um, how long will it take until we do have self-driving trucks really on the street? Um, we don't know exactly, there are estimates, but um, however, there are a lot of people who would also be put out of work if the trucks would drive themselves. On the other hand, there is, I don't, I don't know this ex exactly about the US, but in Germany, there is a talent shortage on drug, uh, truck drivers because um, 50,000 truck drivers retire every year and only 10,000 new truck drivers enter uh, the workforce. So you can make your own calculation that it is not, um, not only a bad thing, that there will be support through self-driving trucks uh, in the future and going over to a completely different field, not in retail, not truck driving, not in the warehouse, uh, distribution warehouses. What about people working in offices? People who do um, things like um, taxes or um, 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 travel funds or payroll. These are routine works that always repeat themselves and can also easily be done by computers or algorithms. Um, not robots in this case. So yes, there is a lot of fear and it's not totally, um, um, well, there, there is a reason for it. And um, it's not totally wrong that robots will take away or algor algorithms will take away a lot of jobs. Oops. <laughs> so there is, um, in, um, but not only, it's, it's not only the fear about the jobs that we are being taken away, but it's also about how complex the whole work is going to be, how people are going to deal with it, how much they have to learn, how much they have to, what kind of new ed education they need and in order to be able to keep up with the demands. Um, the thing is, there is one thing to talk about jobs and how much jobs will be taken over by robots and machines. But on the other hand, if you look at the tasks that the machines can actually take over and the ones that still need to be done by human beings, it's not that we all need to be afraid that human beings will no longer be needed in the workforce. 
just the way that we work and the things that we do will be differently in the future. So manpower, and I'm sorry I forgot to include the, the source on the slide, um, uh, but it's a manpower research report from 2018, so just from last year. They were looking, in, looking at different uh, job fields or fields of, of, of labor to see what kind of task will be taken over by robots and machines and what is still, uh, needs, still needs to be done by human beings. And um, you can see that people are still needed and that there are even fields on the right hand side where um, more people will be hired in the future than today or more talent is needed in the future than today. Um, and the skills that um, will not, as, at least not in the next, well, 30, 40 or 50 years um, be taken over by machines are clearly communication and relation building skills, analytical uh, skills, critical thinking and analysis, networking and influence. And um, um, what was the other? Uh, yeah, um, complex problem solving is also something that people need to do and know machines because that still needs to be something that people have a reasonable thought about. So um, there is a lot of need to upskill the workforce and that of course is in the um, responsibility of the employer and um, they're working on it. We don't know if it's already enough, um, but also it is the responsibility of every individual or of him or herself because we really, we all need to ask ourselves, will I still, or the tasks that I fulfill, the skills that I have, will they still be needed in the future? Or am I doing something that a machine could easily do as well? And um, just to conclude, I think there are, um, we can certainly say, yes, there are quite a lot of jobs that can be taken over by machines in the future, just as it was the case in other eras as well, when um, machines took over labor that was done manually in the, in the past. So a lot of jobs will be automized, but it, it, that, that doesn't mean that we don't need human workforce or individuals in the future. They just need different skills and different education and we need to be aware of that. So I don't think we need to be as afraid as we had seen in the headlines in the beginning, but we need to be aware and we need to be forward thinking and um, we need to find a way to upskill ourselves. Um, I find a found a quote that I found quite amusing and I'm going to share it with you because um, some people seem to think, well, it doesn't really, um, it, it, it's, not only, it's not really my problem, it will take in the very far future and I think we should not underestimate the changes that are happening right now. But some people certainly think um, this is still very far away. I would not agree with that quote. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're going to move on uh, with our second speaker. And please just remember, um, as a German motto says, erst die Arbeit, dann das Vergnügen. First, um, we have the panel. And then afterwards, of course, we have the reception to which all of you are invited as well. So, but then without further ado, um, the, our second speaker is Ms. Claudia Eberhagen. She will be speaking about developing a diverse workforce. Ms. Eberhagen is director of GoToMarket in Cisco's Enterprise Division. Claudia has worked for Cisco for 18 years in sales channel, sorry, sales, channel and technology roles in Germany, in emerging markets, in Latin America and the US. She's also part of Cisco's inclusion leadership team, which supports the company effort in accelerating the development of a competitive workforce through inclusion and diversity. Thank you, Claudia, for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, I wanted to start with a small story about myself, very short. Um, when I started my career 25 years ago in Germany uh, at Siemens uh, in uh, services uh, department, I was the only woman out of a group of 2,000 employees. 
And uh, it was not only that I was the only woman, but in general, uh, the team was not really very diverse, neither in terms of gender, obviously, but also not in terms of background or ethnicity. Fortunately, that has changed over the course of the last 25 years, and diversity has become, especially in the technology industry where I work for, has become a really critical component, and we believe it's critical for our competitiveness moving forward. And that's the topic I will talk to you about in the next few minutes. So let me start telling you a little bit about Cisco, the company I work for today. Um, Cisco is a technology company. We deliver the infrastructure which is required to make the internet work. That means if you have a cell phone, you connect to the internet, you will use Cisco technology. If you connect computers to the internet or enterprises connect between each other, our technology is used. Uh, we are market leader number one or number two in all of the technologies we are part of. We are a multinational company. We have a workforce of 74,000, and uh, we, are, we have 480 um, offices uh, in around 110 countries. And uh, as a company, um, we are currently going, and this is very much in line to uh, what uh, we just heard, we are going through a major transition, a major technology transition. The major tra technology transition is led through automation, analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. I mean, it's here, it's here today. And uh, we have been very successful in starting that transformation, but it still requires uh, a, a long way to go. And uh, to go that transformation, we need the right talent. And I think this is a, 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 a good connection into our previous uh, presentation. So talent is critical, but talent alone is not enough for us anymore. We need diverse talent. Uh, we know that diversity really makes teams more innovative, we know that diverse teams work better together. We know that diverse teams make better decisions. And diversity for us is diversity of age, diversity of gender, diversity of background and experience, and diversity of ethnicity, and many other areas. So as a company, as Cisco, we have been we need, in need to change the way we hire, we retain our employees in this era and in this transfer area of transformation. So what are we doing? So I wanted to share with you some of the things we do uh, to become a more diverse workforce. I think the first thing I wanted to show you is something which probably wouldn't come to you automatically as a thought around diversity, but it's our offices. So over the last few years, we have totally changed the way I made major investments into our offices. Because millennials like to come to the office. My generation in Cisco, we all worked, or most of us worked remotely, but the young generation wants to go back to the offices. They want to meet with their peers, they want to work with their peers. And therefore, we have gone through a major transformation in our offices to make them a place where you can be innovative, make them a place where you can meet informally and work your, with your peers, and where you can also have some fun when you want a break from work. We also, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco, we offer food uh, free of charge to our employees and the snacks all day around. Um, so these are things which are expected. So the offices you just saw is an office in Canada and the other ones, one in San Francisco and one, uh, one in the Bay Area in California. So you know, this, is, you know, this is something which has helped us bring in more young talent into the company. Again, you know, talking about diversity. But we have a number of other initiatives we have been driving around diversity. Um, the first one is our executive leadership team has massively changed over the course of the last two years. Today, our executive leadership, so the team reporting to our CEO, is 58% diverse. We have over 50% of them are women. But it's not only women. We have diversity of age, diversity of gender, diversity of background and ethnicity. 
And of course, that helps us. Every time we look at our uh, executive leadership team, we remember, OK, we also need to do something in our teams. So I personally, I am part of an organization. It's a business unit. Uh, we create um, products around enterprise networking. Uh, we are a 5,000 um, people unit within Cisco, the largest business unit. Um, mostly engineers and product managers, so very, very male uh, dominated and generally in terms of the workforce, uh, also very Asian um, focused in terms of uh, background. And over the last three years, uh, we have been working really hard to bring in and our, improve our diversity. Uh, in our organization. And I am part of, and that's my, not my day job, but my, my hobby or my night job, I am part of the inclusion leadership team of that organization. So what do we do? Um, so there are three areas we get involved. The first one is around hiring. The second one is around retention. And the third one, we also have a number of, let's say, structures of accountability um, around diversity. Hiring. So let me give you some examples. In terms of hiring, uh, we have introduced positions which are dedicated for university graduates because we want to bring in young talent. We have positions dedicated for young people who can do rotations in our company. Uh, we have positions we just in, uh, introduced that uh, two weeks ago, we call it returnships for women who have stayed home with their children or taking care of their families. We give them the chance to come back um, if they have, of course, the right, uh, the right skill set. And, uh, but, but more than that, so we are currently looking at changing the way we write job descriptions because we have noticed that the way we write job descriptions is not open enough to really attract diverse talent. And when we look about hiring, we also have, and that's a company-wide initiative, what we call diverse hiring panels. It means if I have a diverse talent, I don't want my non, a non-diverse team to interview them because the likelihood of a non-diverse panel to hire a, non, a diverse candidate is actually very small. So we can request a diverse panel to, again, interview uh, diverse candidates. And we have a number of other th additional things. I'm happy to talk about it later. Uh, but of course, once we hire, that's not enough. We need to retain the talent. We don't want lonely only, you know, people feeling lonely in their teams. Uh, so we have introduced a number of initiatives there. We have, as an organization, we have uh, 243 chapters in what we call employee organizations, um, so that people can find people who have similar interests. Uh, but we also offer for younger employees and new employees, we have mentorship programs for our um, diverse employees, which accompany them for a year. We have mentoring and, and training uh, to keep them motivated and happy in, in where they are. And then finally, we have structures of accountability. So this is something like what I do, uh, an inclusion diversity team, which are always reminding our management that we need to think about diversity. Uh, we shouldn't forget that. So it's something which people always need to be reminded of. So overall, of course, we are not the only company doing this. There is a number of technology companies driving diversity as a competitive, because we see it as a competitive uh, advantage uh, in terms of in this global environment. Uh, companies like Salesforce, for example, have been made, making major investments over the last two years to get to pay parity between women and men. Uh, other companies like Apple and um, Microsoft have been also doing major investments uh, in, uh, in diversity. We as a company, we are currently, we were ranked last year number seven in uh, diversity uh, worldwide uh, in terms of the more diverse places to, to work. Um, I think in a nutshell, uh, you know, all technology companies have identified that diversity is critical and that it is a, a really a competitive advantage um, for us in this, in this economy, especially in this changing economy. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then third, we have um, Mrs. Christine Blumenwerter from the German consulate in Miami. She will be speaking about, I guess, the German vocational system. 
Uh, and Ms. Blumenreuter is a recently arrived Vice Consul of the Federal Republic of Germany. And um, so welcome to Miami and to our series of roundtables. And she has experienced vocational training in Germany firsthand. And as you may have heard, the vocational training is one of these sort of models that we in the US look forward to kind of getting a more qualified workforce. But I'm sure you can tell us more about that. Thank you. Yeah, first of all, um, thank you very much for the invitation and um, it is my pleasure to talk to you um, about the German vocational system. And since I think that my personal career path is, uh, um, covers a lot of steps of that system, I would like to talk about my um, professional background and I hope that you will find it interesting. And first of all, um, I would like to give you some background information. Uh, in Germany, there are three different possibilities of graduating. Uh, there's graduation from Hauptschule, which you um, attend from grades 5 to 9. And after that you can do a vocational training. And a lot of students who graduate from the Hauptschule um, do a vocational training as craftsmen, like electricians or hairdressers or something like that. Then there's graduation from Realschule, which is similar to the US Junior High. And um, you attend this school from grades 5 to 10, so um, one year longer as Hauptschule. And to attend Realschule, you need certain grades from elementary school. And after that, you can also do a vocational training. And students who graduate from Realschule mostly do a vocational training such as um, office administration or industrial management. And last but not least, there is graduation from Gymnasium. Uh, which is similar to the US high school and which you attend from grades 5 to 13. To attend it you also need certain grades from elementary school and after a successful completion you'll get the German Abitur which allows you to study at any university. And this is what most students will do but with the Abitur uh, you could also decide to do a vocational training. So what I did was I went to Realschule our junior high. I graduated when I was 16 years old and after that I did a vocational training as a doctor's assistant. And a vocational training usually takes around three years and is divided into two parts. One part is on the job training and the other part is going to a vocational school for a program um, focusing on your training. So. Um, I remember that I worked like three days per week at the doctor's office and I went to school the other two days. The idea behind this system is that you learn the academic part regarding your work in school and you do the practical part in your job. The good thing is that you already get paid during the vocational training and the amount increases with each year. And after completing the three years, there's another increase of the salary as you um, get paid the regular amount that is paid uh, in the respective job. After I graduated from this school and received my diploma as a, a doctor's assistant, I worked for two more years in that job. Then I decided to go back to school because I realized that being a doctor's assistant isn't quite fulfilling for me. So I decided to do the German Abitur which you normally get by attending gymnasium. Therefore, what I did um, was not the usual way, but it was something that you could do. Um, I went to a school which is called in German Berufsoberschule, and I found a translation for that, which is Upper Vocational School. I've attended this school for two years, and then I graduated and I had the Abitur, Abitur which allowed me to study at a university, which is what I did. Um, I decided to study economics and in Germany as well as in the US I think uh, you can graduate after three or four years of studying and receive your bachelor's degree and after two more years you get your master's degree um, which is what I did and then after studying <laughs> I went to Paraguay because during my master's program I studied there for five months uh, I took part in an exchange program and since I liked it so much there I went back and there I started to work for the German embassy, however, as a local employee. So I wasn't part of the, of the German foreign, foreign ministry back then. But I decided to apply for the diplomatic um, trainee program on, uh, of the foreign ministry and I got accepted and now I'm here. <laughs> and yeah, 
that was my story. Um, my sister, on the other hand, just to give another quick example, uh, she's a hairdresser. Uh, she also went to Realschule, as I did, and after that she immediately went to a full-time school for hairdressers for half a year. And the duration of vocational training for hairdressers is usually three years as well. But uh, she was able to shorten this time since she went to a full-time school for half a year. So her duration of vocational training was just two and a half years. And this kind of vocational training, going to a full-time school first and then shorten the time of the actual, of the actual vocational training, uh, can be found quite often in Germany as well for certain jobs. Um, I know that is also an option for um, physiotherapists or uh, logopedics, for example. So as you can see, the German vocational system is quite flexible and gives you a lot of um, possibilities. And I think uh, it is a good system, of course. Uh, because a lot of young people who graduate Haupt or Realschule when they are 15 or 16 years old don't know yet what they want to do with their future. So they might do a vocational training as I did, but in the end find out that the job is not the right one for them. So yeah, the German system gives you a lot of options to take another path. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, we saw already a lot of upskilling in your CV, so it's uh, quite, quite impressive. Um, so moving on to our fourth speaker, we have um, Professor uh, Dr. Maida Watson, my colleague from FIU, from Florida International University. Um, she will be speaking about the role of language and language training in these kind of international intercultural um, workforce relations. Dr. Watson is professor of Spanish at FIU, and she's also the foreign language coordinator at the FIU's Center for International Business and Business Education and Research, called Cyber. Uh, I'm going to change things a little bit because I'm not going to talk about Germany. I'm going to talk about the tremendous need for foreign languages and how to become a really advanced workforce by learning foreign languages. Uh, the Center for International Business Research has been working on languages for business, which is a specialty of languages for special purposes. And you may say, well, you really need to learn everything about a language. You can't just learn the business terms. True, but what they're doing is preparing special courses in which you learn all the basics, but you also, instead of talking about Cervantes or Don Quixote or, or one of the, in this case, it would be uh, one of the German literary figures, you talk about business. Your simulations, your discussions, your debates are all exp experiential learning, what's called task-based learning. You, that's how you practice your language, and it makes it more exciting for the student, it makes it more relevant for the students. Now we come to the difference also between foreign language education in Germany and in the United States. I'm really impressed by how much the German government sponsors foreign languages, and I'm really under-impressed by how little our government does. So, or underwhelmed, rather, would be the, the perfect word. Because we are living in some kind of a fantasy world where, maybe not in Miami, where you're constantly reminded that other people speak other languages, but in other parts of the country where people will say to you, well, why are you bothering to learn a foreign language? You're not gonna need it because all the Germans speak English anyway, so why would you need to learn German? Well, there's a lot of reasons for learning a foreign language. And one of the most important ones is that you learn how other people think. Only by going through the, the work of learning a language from the beginning and being able to, having to use it, are you also going to be able to relate to your clients? How can you sell something to somebody when you're having to go through a translator or an interpreter? And I think that this ability to, this necessity for you to have a foreign language, and I realize it's a pain in the, you know what, because it takes forever, but it does have tremendous benefits. And I think if we're going to have a workforce that will be able to, that has a higher salary, and that's gonna be able to compete on a worldwide basis, we're going to have to have a workforce that's educated in foreign languages. That speaks at least two, maybe three, and that it's able to communicate with different cultures and in different languages. And so mine is a little bit off the cuff because I'm not, I'm not talking to you about the, you know, what's going on in Germany. I'm talking to you about the necessity for both sides to learn the foreign languages. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Maida. And then last but not least, we have uh, Ms. Alexandra peters rutten She's one Sotheby's International Realty Advisor in Miami and also a Board of Director of the American, German-American Business Chamber in Miami. Alexandra Peters comes from a varied marketing and public relations background, having held positions in real estate, hospitality, fashion, and art industry. Currently, she holds a position as a global real estate advisor for one Sotheby's, and in that capacity, she's also Sotheby's ambassador to Germany. Um, she's also the daughter of a German diplomat, so she was exposed firsthand to the cultural and business stereotypes between Germans and Americans. Uh, she joined the board of the German-American Business Chamber in order to help facilitate and nurture better German-American business relations. Thank you, Alexander. Well, you basically took my whole speech. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I also can only speak from personal experience rather than um, a bunch of slideshows and, and figures and uh, on things. I actually, driving up here, was listening to uh, a report on NPR News about how Asian graduates are having a really hard time finding jobs. And I thought it's a little bit like that, I think, with Germans, too. Um, I think we, uh, we are overeducated in many ways and don't have a lot of practical experience. And that's why I think the vocational programs are terrific. But, um, but yeah. So yeah, I, I am one of 13 board members of the German American Business Chamber. Um, I am also a global real estate advisor for Sotheby's and their ambassador to Germany, which is uh, interesting and very smart uh, on what they have done. They've tapped into the international group of realtors that we are here in Miami and have said, uh, go out to your respective countries and, um, and try to get clientele from there, which, uh, which is very nice for me. So I go travel back home and I try to educate people who are interested in possibly investing or moving to Miami, which, uh, which is a lot of fun and very fruitful. So I do have a day job. Um, more importantly, yes, I grew up as the daughter of a diplomat. Um, my dad uh, got, us, got transferred to the United States three times. So I was raised, educated, and have worked in both, both countries and got a pretty good idea of the challenges on both sides. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, when you, when you think of a German businessman, what is the first, what, what is the stereotype you most associate? Reliable. <laughs> Reliable, yeah. On time? On time, right. <laughs> and then and how about the American businessman? How how is he perceived? It's it's very different. So I, I noticed that even though I'm bilingual and I am somewhat bicultural, um, you still often don't recognize the, the little nuances and differences um, that do occur on a day-to-day -day exchange in business. Um, and that's also what motivated me to, to join the German-American Business Chamber. I still think there's a lot of misunderstanding. There's still a lot of uh, misinterpretation of how we do business. And I think in order to, to break that, the best thing is to just network as much as you can and get to know people and have first-hand experiences uh, on both sides and, and break those, those challenges. So to give you a little idea about the GABC, I need my little clicker. Well, we really are German business matchmakers. Um, we, are, uh, we try to connect companies and business people that have uh, common interests in connecting with the German-speaking business community. Um, we are a non-profit organization and non-governmental, so we need members. So talk to me later about joining. Um, there's a student membership that's only $50, and it's well worth it if you're interested in, in networking with us. Um, we, we are really here to promote businesses and trade between Germany and the U.S., specifically in South Florida, obviously. Um, there's also a chamber in Atlanta that we work with, but we are, we're here to bring people together that um, want to do, want to ex expand their business or start a business and, and are interested in connecting with the German community here. And yes, we are a platform where you can um, form and nurture business as well as individual relationships between the members. And we try to promote economic, social, and cultural relationships as well. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we offer a whole bunch of very nice things. Um, one of my favorites is actually our breakfast uh, seminars. We, in, we have a uh, lovely space down in, in Brickell with the Kelly Cronenberg Law Firm. 
Uh, and on a regular basis, we host very early 8 a.m. breakfast seminars. We recently had one on the Me Too movement. We had one talking about uh, medical marijuana and how that's affecting the business place. So they're very varied, and they're a very uh, interesting way to, to connect with people. Um, obviously, we have our business card exchanges. We do quite a bit, very much in line with, uh, with Germany. We like to be in the middle of the European happenings, so we work a lot with, with other European chambers. Um, we also offer um, a monthly Stammtisch, which is quite nice. They're more casual. You come uh, to a, a gathering of about 20 people in a restaurant, and it's uh, open to anybody. You don't have to be a member, and it's a nice way to, to connect. Um, we have an annual Award of Excellency din dinner where we honor somebody in the German community. We have a holiday gala. Those are all great sponsorship opportunities for businesses who are coming to Florida who want to tap into the German community. Um, we work very close with the Greater Miami uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. We have uh, good relationships with them. We work, uh, we go, they actually go to Frankfurt and, uh, and have offices there. We work with the Beacon Council, um, with Enterprise Florida, German American Chamber in Atlanta, as I already mentioned. So we do uh, reach out uh, to some of the other, and we can provide a lot of resources. So if you are thinking of, as a German, of opening a business in Miami, we're a good resource to come to for guidance. We have a, a monthly newsletter and a Facebook page, and if you do join, you can, um, you'll be uh, featured in a video clip on all of our social media and in the newsletter. And who are our members? It's interesting. We do have a lot of members, obviously, that have German roots or are connected. But we have probably an equal amount of members that are not German and are just interested in the German community here. Um, we do have that reputation of being very good at business, so people kind of like to piggyback onto us. Um, we are mostly, in terms of companies, small, medium, and individual-sized members. We don't have that many large si companies. Like We do have Mila and Turkish Airlines. But um, that is a point that's actually bringing me to some of the challenges. So I'm talking more about the challenges in Miami rather than globally. Um, we, um, the fact that Miami has almost no manufacturing makes it difficult to, to attract large-scale companies. Um, <coughs> salaries are generally low here. Doesn't make it so attractive for many. Um, most German companies only have very small affiliates that cater to the Latin market. And yes, you do need to speak Spanish if you want to do business here. Um, and st some companies still have issues overcoming you know, the stereotype of Miami being just sort of a fun in the sun place. Um, so we do work together with, with a lot of other uh, organizations to, to break that stereotype. Um, there's a, a reputation of a low level of service. There's a reputation of. Uh, not people not being so ethical, so we, we deal with all those challenges. But from our perspective, this also provides for a lot of opportunity. If you come from a background with a German education and a, and a good work ethic, and you have an idea, Miami is a place to for startups. There is a lot of opportunities here, and people, if you have a, a clear plan and you have a niche that you're filling, uh, people will be open to listen. Um, they're definitely receptive to new ideas, and the nice American good for you is really quite sincere, which I think Germans often interpret as superficial, but I, I do think people are quite, quite sincere about doing business here. Um, there is an influx of professionals now coming more into the Miami area from New York, from California, and from Europe, and with that, the workforce has gotten better. So um, that is a big big advantage. And yes, Miami is, as I say, a place to reinvent yourself. So those challenges that we have can also be turned into opportunities, I feel. And if anybody has questions about the German American Business Chamber, please see me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're right on time. So that leaves us with about 15 to 20 minutes of um, question and answers. Eric Arno with Japan Business Consulting. Uh, I help uh, businesses connect to connect to the Japanese market. And my biggest challenge is that I always struggle with gender equality in Japan. Um, I'm very happy to see that the panel today is more than 80% ladies. Yes. 
So I, I was very surprised, and I really have to say, a very good panel. I very li I liked it very much, but I wanted to hear from the panelists in, in general. Maybe um, whoever wants to answer the question: What do you think is the challenge in terms of gender equality for exactly the topic that we had today for developing a competitive workforce in the future? I can. You can I think speak, I can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting question because in Japan, our our country manager, country uh, vice president, is uh, is a woman, um, and uh, actually she just was promoted as the leader of our Asia Pacific uh, region uh, from Japan. So, but I understand it's uh, it's an ex it's an exception. Um, so I've been. I'm an engineer, an electrical engineer, and I've been always, through my career, I've always been a minority um, by far. Uh, and, uh, but I, I would say that over the last five years, I've started to see a lot of activity, like I said, from the industry um, to drive more women to the technical workforce. Um, starting not only my company, all, you know, all the other co technology companies um, I know, especially in the Bay Area and also in Germany, you know, we do like um, Girls Day, we do Girls in Technology Day, uh, we go into schools to talk to girls, to encourage them to go into technical um, studies. I believe that universities potentially could do I don't know how much is done currently, but also need to play a role in, in, uh, in bringing more women to the workforce. But I think you know, it starts early um, because once you know, the 10 or 15 percent of women come out of university, you know, it's still not enough to get enough diversity. So it needs to be done early and, um, you know, and, and families need to encourage girls who have, are good in mathematics you know, to, t to go into uh, technical studies. Um, so I think, like I said, all companies, we can do as much as we can, but there is only the talent which is out there. And, uh, and like I said, we are okay, also like I say, encouraging that in early stages. I don't know if anyone wants to add something more. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I think it's, a, it's a generation specific. Um, I know that when I, when I was in my, my 20s and 30s and I was looking for jobs in Germany at the time, um, people were much more open to hiring a woman because you know, we had these lovely contracts that would make it very hard to fire you. But then again, they also, when you were in your 30s, they sort of gave it a second thought. Um, whereas in America, you really just get hired because you can get fired if you get pregnant. So there wasn't that much of an issue. But when I talked to my daughter, who's 18 now, um, she does, they're, they're colorblind and age blind. I don't think uh, in that generation it will be so much of an issue. And I think even in America, slowly we are providing for a, a workplace where, where fathers can take off and there is more, more child care. I think in Asia, in Japan, it's, it's more of a cultural thing, too. I think if you're a woman at a certain age and you're not married, you, you're pretty much done. So it's, it's a little different, I think, right? Yeah. I'm not quite so optimistic for Germany, actually, that things will solve themselves. Yeah. Um, because I'm also a lecturer and I see uh, young students and there's still a lot of traditional gender roles. And, um, and I think you have to look at this problem from, from two sides. One is the global challenges, like unconscious bias or stere gender stereotypes. I think this you can see everywhere. Um, but then there are also the regional challenges. And you mentioned Japan. Germany is another example. We have a lot of women who work part-time, are not interested in leadership positions, not interested in leadership positions. And it's really hard um, what companies can do. I mean, the government already does a lot in Germany. Um, but what companies can do, um, I think, is a lot of encouragement. Not only, and you always have this example that when you ask a man um, to step into a role and he fulfills like 70% of the job description, he says, yes, I can do that. When a woman fulfills 110%, she's still thinking, I'm not sure I can really do it. So I think encouragement is very important um, and also role models. What I always hear is when I speak to successful women, they tell me, well, I saw her and I saw the way she did it and I had a role model, I had a mentor, a female mentor in this case. So I think these are things that companies can do and if you have successful women, 
highlight them and um, really try to make them help and support other, especially younger women. May I say something? I think you're perfectly right. I think it starts with the family. I have a daughter who's a doctor. She's a pediatrician and an allergist. She's going to be 40 years old in June, and she's having her second baby in a week. And her family, her husband's family, who are Americans, they have to be German Americans, but that's we forget that little detail. Okay, they are horrified because she is saying, "Well, look, I put 11 years of work in, into this, and now I have to stay home and take care of the babies." So I have been trying to find a babysitter, and this is a horrible thing to her husband's family because mm -hmm. they say, "Well, you should be wanting to take care of your own child. You know, you shouldn't be looking for." And I keep on saying, "11 years." I could have bought a, an apartment in Miami Beach with all that money. You know? So this is family, and this is really close. I happen to have a very supportive husband. Lots of people don't. You know, lots of people don't. I've been chair of my department twice. I must tell you that even after being chair of my department twice, having published 40 articles and eight books, I feel insecure. I keep on saying, when are they going to find out how bad I really am? <laughs> no, you know, and I, and I get up and I, I mentor my, my students who are girls or women. You know, I have seven students writing their PhD dissertation with me, and I keep on thinking to myself, some of them are brilliant. Maybe they should have someone else. You know, not me, because you know, what if I'm not good enough? And this is something that is really, really hard to get rid of. You know, it's our own, in addition to the lousy uh, childcare that we have. And in the United States, and the terrible um, paternity and maternity leave things, you have this subculture, you know? Did you have to be humble superwoman? Anyone else? Has, yes, yes. Uh, this is a question for Claudia, and maybe also for the wider panel. Um, I was wondering whether you had already noticed any tangible um, advantages of the, your drive to be more inclusive. And then for the wider panel, maybe for, I don't know, the lady uh, from, from Munich, I forgot your name, I'm sorry. Um, um, how do you think that being more inclusive could be an advantage of shifting the workforce towards what you mentioned, better problem solving, more analytic, more networking, and, and stuff like that. So, thank you. Yeah, I think the measuring of diversity, that's, you know, there are lots of studies showing, you know, companies which have women on the board will generate more revenues, will grow faster, and um, of course, you know, there must be something behind it, but of course, you know, you want to know and you want to know if we really live it and what we see when we see diverse teams. So what I've personally experienced uh, with diverse teams is uh, that you get a very different dynamic in the teams itself. Um, so just focusing on gender diversity uh, and in an engineering environment, um, Things, if you have an all-male uh, team or maybe just one woman in the team, things go very fast in one direction. And often you don't consider, you know, you don't see the different alternatives um, when you are trying to solve a problem. And in an engineering environment, especially when you need to develop new products and be innovative, you know, that can, you know, and you, it, you can walk in the wrong direction. Uh, what I've seen with more diverse teams, but they need to be diverse. So you need to have a right balance. So diverse is not, you know, 5% or, you know, one woman in a group of 10, um, but it needs to be really diverse. So I'm talking at least a 30, 70 split. Um, you really get a very different dynamic. Uh, for example, women bring, you know, even in a technology environment where people tend to be very introverted, women tend to First of all, bring teams together. Uh, second, also have just a different point of view. And if they feel reinforced, uh, you know, it just it just brings and opens up other perspectives. So we have we have uh, we have successfully seen uh, diverse teams, you know, bring you know great pro great progress and great uh, results in very specific projects. 
Yeah, and to your second question, how being more inclusive can help to upskill your workforce or get this, um, the, the skills that you're looking for, um, it really is a matter of how people can bring themselves to work. If you are feeling included in the workforce, we talk about psych psychological safety in the workplace when you can bring your true self to work no matter where you come from what you look like how old you are what um, sexual orientation you have or religion or whatever when you really feel included in the team when you really feel like I can be myself here you don't have to waste a lot of energy on either hiding certain parts of you or assimilating to the rest of the workforce. You can really bring your skills and your ideas. You don't have to be so much afraid of making mistakes or saying the wrong thing or doing something that doesn't fit or make yourself more fitting. Um, that really helps that you can um, yeah, bring all your talent to work and put all your energy into, the, uh, into your work and developing your talent and not so much into yeah, hiding and trying to be something that you not really are. And I had an example when I was um, speaking to um, uh, partners in the law firm um, when um, I was talking about unconscious bias and stereotypes and then I had them talk in groups about about times when they felt like they need to hide a part of themselves. And uh, there were different examples, like a single mother said she didn't want to, like she didn't want her colleagues to know that she was a single mom because they would probably not give her the tasks, um, the demanding tasks that needed a lot of time to put into work. Or um, a gay um, a partner who always brought a, a woman to the, um, to the, holiday or Christmas party or whatever because he didn't want to bring his male partner in order to be different from the rest of the group. So really giving people that safe environment where they can bring their whole talent to work is something that also helps them to develop their, their skills. Yeah, it's, it's one of the reasons I chose to go in the end after I, I worked for CBS News, I worked for Reuters, I worked for Fash, I really did a lot, but I, the lovely thing about the real estate profession is you are m supposed to be your authentic self. And we are a very rare breed in that sense that we don't, uh, on the contrary, being gay or African American or a single mom is an asset. So you can use that. We're, in that sense, we're a unique profession where you can kind of create your own little business around who you, your authentic self. You don't have to hide anything. Um, hello, uh, first of all, thank you guys for your time and for coming to speak to us. Um, my question is more for, as a college, like recent graduate, I am expect to graduate in December. What do, you, what do you recommend for someone who's looking to um, find a job abroad as a recent graduate? Like what skills or experience do you think, you know, one should develop if we want to go you know, start our career like internationally, especially for non-US non uh, students? I would say first you would learn a foreign language. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to be mute. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a lot of foreign universities uh, are now offering English language programs um, without, without you having to speak the language, they actually, with that program, comes a language course. I know in Berlin you can study, you take a nine month basic German course, the English, the classes are in English and you can go to university there. So I, I, that might be interesting to do something like that for a while because there you don't, you don't have to do another degree. What are you studying? Um, I'm doing a double degree in business uh, and psychology. So I mean, you know, I only have experience working for multinationals and uh, I've traveled, I've lived in 10 different countries uh, with the two companies I've worked for, um, for longer and shorter periods of time. And um, that's always one possibility. A multinational all, can always offer you the possibility to change countries. I have, we have a, a job portal, so if I'm here, I can look for the jobs around the globe and I can apply. And I have just a colleague who just moved to Spain uh, for a new job. I've worked in my, in my company where I'm now, I've worked in Germany, I've worked in Brazil, I've worked here in my previous company, I worked in Portugal, in France, in the, in, in the UK. So, and all of them at least for a year or two, uh, but it was by choice. Um, so a multinational is definitely a possibility 
um, for, for where you can start in your own country and then you know, sh uh, voice the wish to uh, go abroad. And, um, and, um, or if you get into a rotation program, for example, uh, which could also bring you abroad. Depends on what you want to do. Like I said, this is the, would be the example of a multinational. What, what countries are you thinking of? Um, honestly, Any. anywhere. So Germany is definitely um, an could, option, but I, I would around. start with an internship um, somewhere. Uh, you can actually talk to me later. We do have, um, you know, American companies in Germany. There's books and there's German companies in America. You can maybe even look for something here first if you want to start in Germany and start as an intern and then try to get in. If you're an FIU student yeah. or a recent gra graduate, um, next week, uh, Thursday morning, we have a, your European career starts here, career fair at FIU in the SUSC building, is that correct? Yeah, in the SUSC building. So. Exactly. And Verena can give you more information for any of the students who want to check out into opportunities, um, you know, studying, working We're actually working looking Europe. for interns. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just fantastic. Matchmaking. Yeah, wonderful. Well, um, then I think there's nothing much left except to thank our panelists. So thank you very much for your expertise. I'm sure you're going to be open for any other questions or comments for the reception, which is in the back. But let me just um, finally remind you that we will have one final roundtable of the Deutschland Jahr program, and that will be on Thursday, April 11th. Is it here? Yes. On um, the political polarization and the rise of populism in Germany and the US. So that should be also very interesting and current. We will, that will also feature guest speakers from the University of Magdeburg and University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, lastly, um, with, the re with the refreshments and the reception and the food there, there will be German music played by Miss Claire Geho and Mr. Karl Stachnik, who are setting up here in the back from the University of Miami's Frost School of Music. So thank you for that as well. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, guten Appetit. Thank you. Thank you.